Look, let's get this out of the way first. Starting a YouTube channel is not going to give you overnight success and a lot of money. It's going to take you probably at least six months and more realistically like 12 months between uploading your first video and reaching, I would say about the 1000 subscriber mark where you know, you're starting to build up that small but loyal audience and then you can like snowball it from there. But I like to compare it with the saying that there are two points really where you should plant a tree. Either 20 years ago you should have done it or you can plant it today. And I think with YouTube, it is definitely something similar. I get asked very often like, hey, should I make a YouTube channel for my game? Will it be able to maybe give me wish lists, give me more funding for development? Maybe you can like start a Patreon as well to allow for you to fund your game's development because it can be really hard sometimes to actually have the money to make your first game or like even if your first game fails your second game and looking at us we're a great example of that is our studio would not exist without youtube let's just be honest about it and i would say that generally starting a youtube channel for your studio not your game your studio is a great thing to do I'm quickly diving into three different reasons why I think it's good that you start that YouTube channel. And then also I'll be giving you five different tips that are very simple on how you can get started with like recording your first video today still and uploading it if you wanted to YouTube. And I think the first reason why you should have that YouTube channel in the first place is to simply train yourself to be able to talk about your game. This is a problem that I see often when I talk to other game devs who are like in our Discord server, for example, or I meet them at like physical game dev events and I'm like, okay, cool, this looks nice. Like maybe they have a good art style. Can you tell me about what is this game and why do I want to buy it? Like, like why should I be interested in it? And then what I notice is that a lot of game developers, they just like kind of die at that point because up until then they had been working in their bedroom or something on their own just slaving away at Unity or Godot and trying to make their own game but they never really had to sit down and sell their game so to say. Not like actually like someone buys it but simply why is the game good? What's its hook and things like that. And that is something that having that YouTube channel forces you to do because you're forced to talk about your game if you're making a game dev YouTube channel. Kind of obvious and it just gives you a lot of dry runs basically to see what am I talking about in my game or like what is my game about and then what is the feedback that I will be getting. Of course, the first videos you make, you'll probably get not much feedback, but you can still like get some by like going to our Discord server. And that way you're preparing yourself as early as possible already to do things like writing that Steam page marketing copy. Like what is your short description going to be? Those 300 characters are very, very important to actually selling your game because that is basically where the core hook and like the reason why people should buy your game should be in there. You want to have that tested out and just gone through that yourself as much in advance as possible. The second advantage is that you can build a community of other developers and what I would like to call them as well is playtesters. So what you hear often and what I've said as well is that look, if you want wish lists, having devlogs is not a good idea because people who watch devlogs are other developers and they're generally Sure, they'll wishlist, but they won't convert as much into actual sales most of the time. And they may not be like your core audience for whatever style of game you're making. And that's fine. But what they are really good at is breaking your games and actually giving you feedback on what is probably going wrong. So we did a lot of playtesting with Songs of Everjade, for example. And every playtest we did, back then we had like 15,000 subscribers, a little bit less. We had 200, 300 people playing the game and giving us feedback. That is something that is extremely, extremely valuable. Sure, it can be overwhelming to get that much feedback, but other developers who don't have that audience, they would kill to get that many playtesters for free. And sure, it's not the same like high quality as an actual QA department, but it's still also better than asking your mom to go and play your game. That's like your desperate like lost case resort. What these developers playtesting your game also have in common is generally they understand the technicalities of your engine. So maybe for some reason on some person's device, like the game is extremely laggy or slow, for example, well, he could point us into the direction of, hey, maybe is there something with your save system that is just killing the IO operations on my hard drive versus we all ran the game on SSDs. Yes, that was the reason. That is something that a normal player will never think about. And having those developers, especially in the earlier stages of playtesting, can be extremely valuable because they also understand that, hey, there are things like placeholder art and 
not everything has to be final yet. Sh what should I focus on? What is easy to add later on? And what is something of the game that should really be nailed down as fast as possible? Those are really important pieces of feedback to get and to Game dev community is generally pretty chill and they generally, if you have a demo available on edge.io or whatever, they will give it a go and give you some feedback, which you are going to need. But of course you can't just make your first video be like, hey everyone come and play test my game. You need to build up that audience in advance, which is why it's important to start that YouTube channel in advance as well. And of course, the, the third one, which is the one that people care about the most, is it can become an extra revenue source. Now, the big, giant, enormous caveat here is it takes a long time. And even then, like YouTube AdSense on its own, it isn't that much money. I'll put up our AdSense for the past like a few months or whatever. It is not enough to sustain you, uh, is what it comes down to. Right now, it's about 400 euros every month, which sounds nice, but of course, that's not enough. But you can then also look into things like Patreon, you can do things like selling courses or whatever. There are a lot of ways that you can monetize your YouTube channel. But I think that is one of those things where, okay, you can get the first 1000 subscribers in like a year, but then actually going to a point where you can monetize. Our channel has only really gotten profitable somewhat like two, three months ago. If you're someone who is really interested in like how does the financials work off starting your own YouTube studio, then I would suggest you head over our Patreon because there we do every month, we do like full cost and income breakdowns of things like our affiliate sales, our sponsorship deals, anything really in terms of our business, we give you all the numbers. And I think that can give you a lot of extra insights if you're planning on taking this game dev YouTube stuff pretty serious. There's a more videos on there as well where I go deeper in depth into certain topics. So I think there is definitely a lot of value you can find there. However, once again, I do get those people who come to me and they're like, hey, I want to start my own game dev studio and I want to do a Patreon. And I'm like, look, calm down. You're not going to be able to really do that Patreon anytime soon because you need to have a somewhat of a critical mass. This is something I see as well is YouTube channels that have like, I would say only start a Patreon once you have about 10,000 subscribers, anything less than that, you're going to have the problem that you won't have that many patrons. You'll have like five or something, which let's say gives you between 20 and $50 a month extra. Sure, that sounds nice, but generally patrons also require you to do extra work. Maybe that's early video releases, that's bonus content. Doing that for just like four people is not gonna be worth it. We started our Patreon and we immediately had like, I think 15 people joining then you already have that scale a bit more that justifies putting in the effort. Once again, on our own Patreon, we have like the full number breakdowns of how has our business been evolving. I think it can be really interesting. So it's clear, you need to build up that YouTube channel as early as possible. Now, how do you start exactly? Well, it's pretty easy. You just turn on the camera and record, but there are five tips I have now that I just quickly want to go over. And I think the main number one thing, anything else does not matter at all. If you want to have a YouTube channel that is going to have any growth, you need to have amazing audio. And what I mean by this is that even though YouTube is a video medium, the video quality doesn't really matter that much. You can just put on your 720p webcam if you really wanted to, and people can live with that, but audio is one thing that people do not like. If you have bad video but good audio, people will keep watching. But if you have like great 4K video and then you have shitty audio, nobody cares about your channel. I think, okay, I'm gonna throw him under the bus. Chris Sikowski, for example, he's been dabbling in the YouTube stuff, but he uploads like videos where the audio is only in like one ear. It's like mono sound. Nobody will watch it, even though it has like amazing, amazing quality of like the actual value he delivers with like his, his video and like the PowerPoint presentation he goes through. Because the audio is so horrible, people just drop out. And basically my advice here is don't use a headset microphone. Not a single headset microphone sounds good enough. Even a lot of those gaming like standalone microphones have questionable audio if you ask me. If you have like a very baller streaming setup for some reason that you like convinced your mom to do, okay, you're good there. But I don't really think you need to spend like immediately $500 on a Shure SMB7 and then an XLR interface. What I would recommend is having something like this, which is a lavalier mic. It's like one of those little microphones that has like the, the clippy thingy that you just put underneath here. It has superb audio. Now this is the Rode Wireless Go 2. This one is already kind of expensive. This one I paid for like 300 euros. You do not need this. You can also just get like 40 euro like wireless lavalier microphones that sound just as good almost. 
and even that will already massively increase your channel's quality. So really, if you do any of these tips, focus on the audio as much as possible. If you have audio that is not bearable to listen to, nobody will watch your videos and you will not be able to grow. And then you get the next overwhelming question and it is, what should my channel even be about? I think the best thing to do here is to make studio-based channels, which are pretty broad still. You can mix in some of your own personality, your own experiences. You can talk about your game and your sequels and your like longer term plans and more also like general like studio branded topics. I think this is a pretty solid approach because it also allows you to build of more of a long term audience where people who are subscribed to you aren't there for just one game. And then you are kind of locking yourself into working on that game for seven years because the moment you stop development on that game, your audience will leave. And once you have that, what I would do is find similar channels like my channel or someone like, I don't care, Thomas Brush or something. I took a lot of video ideas that like Thomas Brush did, like I sorted by popular and I just looked at, okay, what is his title? And like, what is his thumbnail basically? And I'm like, okay, how can I take this title and just reading the title, not watching the video, what would I talk about? So like, it's simple things like, oh, five mistakes that I did starting my studio. That is something that you can already do if you have like two months of experience making a game. Maybe you've joined a game jam and be like, hey, these are five experiences of me joining a game jam. There are plenty of things that you can talk about. And definitely in the beginning, you do not need to be original in terms of every video you make has to be 100% new. There is nothing like it on the internet. The first video we had that like kind of blew up was our game design document one. There are like 5 million game design document videos on the internet already. We weren't reinventing the wheel. We were just bringing my own background, my own biases to that topic. And that is what resonated with people already because it's a different way to tell the same thing. So don't be scared to talk about things that other developers have talked about already. Let us do the heavy lifting of, okay, just throwing video ideas at the wall until finding something that sticks and then take that title and be like, okay, now I'm going to be making my own version of that. But bear in mind that even with those like video ideas that you've like filtered out from other people, your first 10 videos are probably not going to be good anyway. And the important thing here is you go for good enough but don't try to focus on your first videos immediately banging. There are some YouTubers who do that, like they make a channel out of nowhere and they have like one video and it immediately gets like 400,000 or a million views or something. And it's like one of those videos that spends like months in editing. I don't think that is the approach that you should go for if you just want to go and grow really, because it is a very, very big gamble and you probably don't have the editing background and the story writing background to make that YouTube video that good that it can actually have that like million views. Instead, accept that, hey look, the first 10 videos I'm gonna make are probably gonna suck. They're purely there just so you can learn. Look at our first 10 videos. They were horrible. I'll like link some of them down below. I think if all you focus on is just some basic editing, which means like cutting out some bad takes and like cutting out the part where you are like opening your OBS or like closing it to start and stop a recording and just make the video flow pretty decently already. There is like no long silent periods where you're like trying to think about what to talk about. That is already enough. Sure, you'll be rambling sometimes and sure there will be points where you're like, this is dumb, what was I saying here? Just leave them in, cut out like the smaller parts that are like just silences and upload those. You'll get better at editing over time by doing it more. It took me about a hundred plus videos until I really felt like, hey, I'm somewhat decent at basic editing. I still think my editing is pretty garbage when you compare it to like the more entertainment game dev YouTubers that are like full of memes and whatever. That's not the style I'm going for, but even the style of these YouTube videos that you see on this channel, even though it's very basic and it's mainly a talking head and some B-roll, that still takes a bunch of time. So don't go for crazy video editing. Go for good enough, especially those first 10 videos, and you will probably not be happy with it. And that is fine. Just push the upload button and you'll be done. Some of the videos on our channel that have performed the best are the ones that I personally don't like. For example, the three months to start a studio video, I think it's like top five or something. I recorded and edited that video in a single panic induced afternoon because I was like, fuck me, I have no upload for today scheduled yet. Let me just record something. I think the quality of that video was really bad, but somehow the YouTube audience still likes it. So remember that you are one viewer but you are not the only person who watches your channel. So maybe it's something that doesn't 100% vibe with you, but it will still vibe with other people. 
Then also another piece of advice I have, especially if you're doing those studio YouTube channels, is to show your face. I know you're like, oh, I'm awkward on camera. I was awkward on camera. Showing your face, it's simply a cheat code to getting longer retention is one thing I would say, like because there's permanent movement. I don't need to have Minecraft parkour gameplay in the background. You can just look at my face move. And it's also a good thing in terms of being more memorable and more branded. You have to remember that you're starting a studio channel and you are the head of your studio most of the times. But putting up your face, sure, you'll get some mean comments maybe. Although no one has really criticized my face, mainly just our games. But this is really important to build that long-term audience really. That's the best way I can describe it because people can relate more to an actual other human being who also has some flaws and who doesn't look perfect than like some disembodied voice that is like put on top of some random platformer footage, for example. There is a big difference there. I know it's gonna feel very awkward the first times you like have your face on camera and your family sees it or whatever. At this point, my grandma watches every single video. Hi, grandma. And it's like you get over those things. So it's just something that you're going to have to get through, but it's going to pay off. And then the last thing that will pay off is be as open as possible. If there was a single thing that I would attribute this channel's success to, it is our radical transparency is what I like to call it. We talk about everything. We talk about a lot of the numbers. I absolutely despise, I've talked about this in other videos already, YouTubers who are like, hey, this is how I grew my wish lists. And then they like blank out the wish list numbers. And it's like, cool, bro. You know that there are other tools we can use to see like wish list estimations anyway, right? It's just pointlessly kneecapping yourself. I think that is also when I talk to people about like, hey, what do you actually like about this channel? It's either, okay, I'm like a jolly personality, like my face, which is why you should use your face, or it is that we are so transparent about everything. I am not pretending to be better than I am. Forge industry wasn't a success. I think we're pretty humble in that regard. I don't know, maybe this is a bit too much virtue signaling, but things like, okay, look, here is just our Steam dashboard. Let's just talk through it. Those are really important things to talk about. And that is a big differentiator between you and other YouTube game devs. That is going to give you an unfair advantage, if you ask me. A lot of other game devs are like, oh no, I don't want to show my wishlist because maybe if I get a publisher, they'll be mad at you. And I'm like, once again, you have 2000 wishlists. What publisher is going to sign with you? Just show the value to the people. That's going to be much more worth it in the long run than just like hiding everything and pretending that your entire game dev career is sunshine and rainbows, which let's be honest, it's not going to be. Just talk about those things. It's free content. Negativity gives you a lot of views I've learned as well. Even though I try not to do too much of those videos, being transparent is probably one of the best things you can do to give your viewers actual value when they watch their videos. So really just get started with those YouTube videos is what I would say and Maybe also a second plug is once you have uploaded like a few of those first videos, once again, we have our Patreon where you can actually just talk to me. Like you can just book like a one hour time slot where I sit down with you and we talk about, okay, how is your game going? How is your studio going? Or in this case, how's your YouTube channel going? I kind of know a little bit at this point about how the YouTube stuff works. So if you don't want to just like me, spend 15 months trying to get a thousand subscribers and then another six months trying to get monetized, I think that can definitely help you expedite that journey. So apart from that, I'm really curious, what are the reasons that you have that you haven't started a YouTube channel that are not mentioned in this video? Are you scared of something else maybe? I'm really interested to hear about that because I think this video addresses most of the big issues that people have already. Apart from that, if you haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, please do so. Only about 35% of our audience is actually subscribed, which is kind of weird if you ask me. So really, if you could do me a favor, head down below and subscribe. In exchange, you get these videos twice a week where we just talk about the things that are going on in our studio with our games development and pretty much anything else really that I feel like talking about. So that's all I really had to say. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.